Reply. <laughs> <laughs> Be professional. Fo focus. <clears throat> We're good. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. And as you well know, I'm always delighted to have my uh, my guests on my podcast. But today, I'm super stoked to have finally tracked down the awesome, and amazing, and wonderful Simon Kemp. Uh, Simon is the founder of Kepios, and his headline says, "Making sense of the world's digital behaviors." If you haven't seen Simon's reports in conjunction with um, uh, Hootsuite, We Are Social, and a number of number of other data supporters on that then you must be hiding under a rock because I treat Simon's insights data as the digital Bible. It's free, it's an incredible resource, and um, I'm just super stoked to have Simon on here. I've never said stoked in my life. Why well, I'm saying that. <laughs> no, Take it twice um, as well. Very stoked. embarrassing. Um, trying to be down with the kids on TikTok, maybe. Uh, little warning, Simon is Scottish, so there may be some fruity language in here, just so don't get triggered if you do. I do apologize in, in advance, but <laughs> Enough me, Simon. <laughs> now we've got the technical stuff out of the way as well in terms of we had some slight problems with the microphones before going live. Yeah. It was like going live in an ITV TV studio. Um, I'll shut up. <laughs> Simon, over to you. Who are you? What you're all about? What do you do? Thanks, Alex. Uh, finally, great to meet. We've been speaking on the internet for a couple of years now, so it's bizarre to actually meet you semi in person via video. Thank you for inviting me on your show. It's very kind of you. Um, so as you said, I help people make sense of what the world is doing on the internet, social media, mobile devices and e-commerce. So Kepios is in theory a consultancy, but that is as wishy-washy as it sounds. Kepios is whatever anybody wants it to be. <laughs> uh, but the majority of our work at the moment focuses on those global digital reports that we publish on behalf of We Are Social and Hootsuite. So pretty much everything you want to know about consumer digital behaviours in 240 plus countries around the world. Um, as you already warned the viewers and listeners today, I do have an occasional Tourette's habit to say bad words. Um, <clears throat> it's a cultural thing. I'll excuse myself that way. So apologies if I say bad words. Um, I'm also a massive, massive nerd. So I'm likely to get way too enthusiastic about stats that other people may not find as interesting and continue to talk until you tell me to shut up. So uh, whenever you feel the need to interrupt me, please do. And uh, hopefully we'll manage to keep it interesting. That sounds all very good to uh, to me, Simon. So uh, your recent research that's come out April 2021, just to give some headline stats I'm reading here now, so 4.72 billion people now on the Internet, 60% uh, of the world's now uh, has global. 60% of the po total population have got access to the internet. Uh, yep. Up 7.6, six and a half, seven, almost seven hours of average spent online. 92% of that is almost 93% of that is spent on uh, on mobile. People will spend a combined total of 12 trillion hours on the interweb, which is kind of a depressing. Um, State of I'm depressing at all. It's great. <laughs> and I look at my three, my six year old, almost six year old. She's six next week. He goes, Daddy, 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 can I have a phone? I'm like over my dead body. Um, <laughs> what, what, what does this all, all mean? And the other point I want to pick up because I'm very much B2B, you talk around the kind of consumer behavior on, yeah. on the internet, as it were. But fundamentally, for me, B2B and B2C is kind of blurring yeah. one uh, anyway. So the research that we're touching on is appropriate kind of for, for both sides of the coin, if you will. Is that correct? Is that fair to yeah. say? Absolutely. So this is based on what people are doing on the internet. And mysteriously enough, apparently B2B humans are still human beings. So, um, yeah, <laughs> it, it's it's collected. Gen so it's it's a, a lot of it is survey based. Some yeah. of it is um, activity based. So the social media data in particular will collect from the data platforms. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but a lot of the GWI survey data that you'll see throughout the report, all of that is survey based. So asking people questions. And when you ask people what they do on the Internet, increasingly, especially with people working from home and stuff like that, they're not really making the distinction between what is work time and what is personal time when it comes to the internet they're usually doing both and we're still being in some ways productive i hope but yeah the world hasn't completely fallen apart from a work perspective fortunately despite the challenges of covid so it's clear that even if people are juggling personal and work stuff at the same time we're making it work so yeah i think what your question what does this all mean try and unpack 10 years worth the research and all that into pithy sentences which i'm not desperately good at succinctness is not my strong point um but i think you know what this all means it's very clear that digital is now an indispensable part of everyday life for most 
most people around the world. So that 60% of the world's population stat saying most people is now statistically correct, as well as being just a general sort of <clears throat> makes yeah. life easier to say most. Um, a lot of it is mobile, just to sort of clarify some of the, the numbers in there. So 92% of internet users are accessing via mobile, but actually it's roughly 50-50 when it comes to time spent. So okay. just over half of the internet time is spent on mobile, but laptops, desktops, and other kinds of bigger devices still make up a considerable amount of time. And once you get into the B2B world, that tends to be even higher. So a lot of people still doing their yeah. desk work on a desktop or laptop. Not surprising. I think, you know, you want that that screen real estate to be able to do the work on a spreadsheet or just the bigger, even browsing the internet, that kind of stuff. So I think a lot of businesses, especially make the mistake of thinking that mobile first means mobile only and yeah. in actual fact that's not not the case at all i think a good healthy balanced diet when it comes to devices is what you're looking for what we then do within the time so the seven hours that we're spending roughly every day obviously there's a huge amount of different stuff in there yeah. and that's kind of the point i was trying to make with the, the indispensable part of everyday life we're even tracking our sleep uh, when it comes to what we're doing on the internet, you know, you've got these clever apps that tell you how well you slept. So you wake up anxious knowing how well you slept. Isn't it weird? Um, but, you know, all the other stuff that we do in our waking hours, everything from the obvious stuff like social media through to increasingly we're watching streaming platforms like Netflix. We're doing our banking. We're doing our shopping. We're finding love through platforms like um, you know, all these different dating apps that people have got. So you name it, there is a connected service for everything now if you can tell me something that isn't connected in some way i will be quite impressed i'm sure we can find an app for that to quote the apple ad i know it's uh, this connected world that we find ourselves in is kind of uh, it's kind of crazy and especially even like looking where cars now you know we're looking at getting in the yeah. our latest volvo coming out connected to google obviously teslas are connected to, to spotify and so on but if we just take a step back because the word digital mm. I think you ask 10 different people, 100 different people, what their perception of digital is, you're going to get 100 different different answers. So in, in when we are in your world, and obviously you've got 10 years worth of, you know, data, you know, data, huge amount of data set to work on. What do you believe digital to, to mean? Anything that is internet powered. So it doesn't have to be going onto the World Wide Web. And I think that's the important distinction. A lot of people use those things interchangeably. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I don't think anybody ever talks about the web anymore. The kids are like, well, what's the web? Um, digital, so your phone is mobile connected, sorry, internet connected when it has data, but you're not necessarily on the internet in your mind and i think once you get into especially the developing economies this is a really interesting challenge when it comes to the research is if you ask people if they're on the internet they say no but then you say but you're on facebook oh yeah, yeah absolutely so <clears throat> it's this kind of interesting thing that they they don't perceive the internet in the same way that perhaps somebody like you or i that has yeah. used it for much longer has done um so for me yeah anything that has data connectivity through an internet Mm -hmm. is basically digital in my mind um <clears throat> that's kind of a a loose description if you like you you then get into this weird world of the stuff that you do on your mobile phone that may not be permanently connected and yet it somehow qualifies as being digital, digital. so yeah i'm i'm as loose with that definition as i think a lot of people <laughs> try and be because it doesn't really matter at the end of the day it doesn't but I, I actually quite like that in terms of it being internet uh, internet powered because i think that gives kind of a base point to uh, to work for them fundamentally and we will kind of come on to the, the the tracking and always on within this in terms of um, some research i saw around cookies but the phones for the most part if you want to get the best out of them you typically have got to be always on and it's got to be yeah. doing something to get the best overall um uh, overall experience so I mean, there's so much in, you know, in, in your <laughs> book. So I'm going to let you pick kind of some salient, um, you know, salient points out. But one that I'm going to pick, though, that I do want to you know, touch on, whether we do it now or um, uh, in, in a while, is the piece around email marketing, which caught my eye. Because everyone, and I've been guilty of this, I've freely made hands up being guilty of this, going email marketing is crap, open rates are crap, it doesn't <laughs> Yeah, I probably noticed a change myself in terms of my reaction to email marketing when it's good and it's directed at me and it's personal. Yeah. So what can we draw out of the, the research that you, you saw on that from, from me? Screw it. Let's answer that question now because I've asked it. <laughs> Having told you, you're going to 
things. I've now picked some things. Email marketing. Let's unpack your stats on that. <laughs> we have to start somewhere, and this is as good as anywhere. I think this is one of the surprises, right? I think it, it's fascinating that this is one of the most talked about slides in the most recent report, because if you look anywhere else in the media, we're always looking for shiny new toys. We get yeah. distracted by the latest social platform, the latest app, you name it. <clears throat> Email has been around for 40 something years, maybe yeah. longer than that. I don't know exactly. It's been around for a long time. You kind of hear stories all the time that email is dead and the stories of its demise have been greatly exaggerated based on the data that we've got. So I'm looking at the chart in front of me now, which is yeah. why I'm creepily looking down. 78.7% of the world's internet users are aged 16 to 64 using web-based email every month. So this isn't even the entirety. This is just web-based email. By that, I mean things like Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo Mail, still very popular. Um, it, it's incredible. I think what really stands out in this data, though, is that it's consistent use across age groups and gender. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people assume that the younger age groups don't use email. In fact, the numbers are so steady across all age groups. We're looking at more than three quarters of all, e uh, all email users, all internet users using email across those age groups. So yeah, I mean, email is a big, big part of people's lives. It's not sexy in the way that a TikTok might be, but it's still incredibly powerful. The fact that people use it doesn't mean that it's a magic answer. So, oh my goodness, everybody's using it. So if I send out an email blast, then I'm guaranteed riches. Sadly, that's not quite what the data is telling us. It means that this is an interesting opportunity mm -hmm. and it's perhaps a much bigger opportunity than you would have identified had you not seen that data. But what do you do with the data? I think you know what's really interesting about what I've been seeing in addition to just that overall stat, some of the latest findings on the use of email marketing for e-commerce are really encouraging. So incredibly good rates of conversion from email, if done correctly. Now, I hasten yeah. to add the, the quality of your creative and what you're emailing to people is obviously the essential part of this. But in terms of if you have to choose between email and organic social, yeah, I think a lot of people in the e-commerce world, especially when they're looking at younger age groups, would have said inevitably that it's social that's the answer. And in fact, the data very clearly shows that email is twice as powerful as organic social. Now, once you get into paid social, it's a very different story mm -hmm. because you can be very targeted and you can do clever things. But, you know, I think from that perspective, if you're not still using email, then now is a good time to go back and look at why you're not using it and whether there's an opportunity to add it back into your mix. Having said that, in the same way that we had to choose topics to talk about today, Alex, I think, you know, marketers are in, they're overloaded, they're overwhelmed yeah. with options in their mix. Um, if you've knocked it out because you think do people don't use it, now's a good time to put it back in. But if you've got other things that you know are working well for you, that's not a reason to compromise that success and just add it back in for no reason. So this is the bit that I get slightly worried about. I hear a lot of people, you know, a lot of our clients, for example, asking questions about, should we be doing this? Should we be doing that? It's like, how many things do you think you're going to be able to do yeah. in a month? prioritize you know if you can do three things well you're doing a good job i live and breathe digital and the marketing of my business it comes down to linkedin a little bit of twitter and a blog and that's kind of all i do yeah. i don't i don't do everything because i just simply don't have the time and i'm sure i'm not alone in that indeed and i think you raise an interesting point there around um it's not all things to all people and scott brinker who i follow who's the, who does the cheap martech stuff and you know, he's also at some uh, at hubspot you know, he released some research the other day that saying that marketing teams are getting more and more kind of tech for those listening. I'm doing inverted commas and AI inverted commas that's supposed to help <laughs> save time. But because none of these platforms actually talk to each other, they're having to do yeah. more manual tasks and spending more time on the manual tasks with technology that's supposed to save them time in terms of what they're, you know, what they're um, they're doing. And I, I like the fact that you actually, you know, clarified the point that email as a channel is still very relevant based on what your data is saying big caveat though it still comes down to the content and how you yeah. engage and what you're talking about which actually is in terms of anything that you're doing on either yeah. you know the internet or even if it's you know printed mail through the through the door it still comes down to the actual messaging the content and being relevant to your um uh, to your intended uh, intended audience so yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's something that I need to to revisit and consider. And if you also look at um, see what you know, you talk about LinkedIn being a very powerful platform for you in terms of delivering your message, and that's how I met you and bumped into you in terms mm. of your research. Is that uh, LinkedIn's now building out newsletters? So yeah. what was Pulse? You know, they're now building that out into you know your articles can be turned into newsletters, which is delivered via yeah. 
via email. So we kind of gone, feels like we're going full, full circle. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, LinkedIn's not alone. Twitter have just announced that they're doing a similar thing as well. And I think this desperate attempt to be all things to all people, I think, is a little bit of a weird one. If you look at where Instagram started and why Instagram became so successful in its early days, it's because it did one thing and it did it really well. As a company goes public and as it's got to answer to shareholders and shareholders unfortunately have very limited understanding of how these things work, they want everything to be the magic answer to everything. They want yeah. all of their investment to suddenly be you know, dominating everybody's lives. It's just not the way that the average person works. So, yeah, I mean, I think digital does have the, marketing, digital business. Everything yeah. has this habit of going around in circles, right? And I think knowing that there's too much stuff on social media generally speaking yeah. your feeds have become because because as a user we've added so much stuff to our feeds we've friended everybody we've ever met yeah. we've added random people because we wanted the follower counts we've introduced all these brands into our feed we started following influencers you know suddenly you've got all this stuff and then you turn it on and you start scrolling and you're like i can't actually digest it all so i need yeah. a more focused way of doing it and suddenly nobody's sending me emails anymore except spammers and fortunately the spam filters have got really good for the most part so actually i've got very few things in my inbox that compared to my social media feed and therefore it's yeah. actually more practical so yeah, that will change as suddenly people think email is a great opportunity then suddenly your email inbox will flood again and then you'll go back to your empty instagram feed and be like oh it's nice and clean <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean i think the idea as a marketer that you're going to find one magic tool that's going to be your answer to everything and you'll never need to worry again it's just crazy every three months things are going to cycle yeah especially, especially at the moment i think in terms of you know what what we're seeing in the, the the research that I'm starting to see <clears throat> come out in this kind of post-COVID new world hybrid, whatever it is we're going to be moving into. So things like, you know, we were touching this before we came on air, is the Forrester research, which I think people are bored of me citing, but this is with the B, <laughs> this is with the B2B lens. Um, follow Seth Mars at Forrester if you're not. Um, their survey came out in January of this year. What are we now, May? It's crazy. Uh, the, yeah. So 2021. Uh, 60 odd percent of their respondents said they can now shortlist vendors purely on digital digital content. So without actually talking to, to a salesperson, Gartner is now saying that one in three millennials, I hate the label, but don't want to engage with the salesperson throughout a sales process. I'm not saying I don't want to talk to a human being. So with those kind of stats, what other kind of research or insight have you seen in your last report, which kind of starts to maybe talk to some of that to get marketing teams and sales teams to start thinking maybe you've got to do things a little bit differently yeah so that's a good point i'm just i'm loading up charts again as we speak so in the most recent april report we've got some great data towards the end of the digital marketing section mm -hmm. that talks about the channels that people look at so this yeah. is primarily b2c but we did in i believe it was the july 2020 report have a very similar um, set of data for b2b activities as well the thing that surprises me in that data, including the, the B2B stuff, is the continued importance of the website. Again, another thing that, you know, as recently as even a few months ago, you've still got clients asking whether they should even have a website anymore, considering the power of social media. When people are researching products, which mysteriously yeah. enough, they still spend a lot of time doing. Who would have yeah. thought that, right? Um, especially in a B2B world, people do do a lot of research. And like you're saying, you know, a lot of people are going to get to a shortlist without speaking to anybody. And that's increasingly the case. The younger, this is based on the data that I've seen, but yeah. the younger the person, the less likely they are to interact with a human mm -hmm. until they've already got an idea of roughly what they want. Once they've yeah. shortlisted, then they'll start speaking to people. Mm -hmm. But that means that a huge amount of the initial phase is going to be through digital channels the one exception to that is real world events which obviously covid is somewhat challenged but without covid real world events in a b2b setting are still crucial and are still one of the primary sources of both introductions to new brands and also shortlisting so yeah. once we get back to that under no circumstances discount the value of that channel but you've kind of got real world events and digital and they work hand in hand people are doing their shortlisting and then they're speaking to a human and i think <clears throat> If you think about, I don't know whether this is the same for you in your world, but if you think about the average sales pitch, it's a rehearsed presentation yep. and you can do that on video and people can watch the bits that they want and they can skip through it and you're wasting your time if they're not interested after that in a real world setting anyway. So yep. absolutely that polished sales pitch should be a video front and center on your website mm -hmm. or 
that you're distributing as an individual through your social media channels if you're part of a sales force and you've got your individual quotas that kind of thing yeah. i think people just <laughs> it's gonna sound a little bit blunt and harsh but i think it's just a little bit of common sense when you're thinking about this stuff of what is it that your audience really wants yes mm-hmm. you would like to have a face-to-face meeting with them because you can maybe do some magic but if you're going to have to discount that what are the one or two things that you can do that are going to increase your chances of forming a relationship email still going to work video marketing is a fantastic opportunity mm-hmm. and building relationships with people on linkedin just you know people like yeah. you that i see regularly just having conversations with people it's not just constantly like we've released a new product contact me for information it's like hey i saw that you did this i'm interested in that let's chat about things that are not about me selling you stuff but keep me front and top of mind and that's the bit that a lot of people forget when it comes to the digital world is this is about frequency and affinity it's not about last mile conversion which is what way too much of the marketing literature talks about Mm -hmm. it's about all this weird fluffy stuff that happens beforehand and we don't think that digital is great for that because we can't measure it that's and the, yet. that's what I have to say. It's impossible. It's it's very very hard to kind of prove again in vertical commerce to those who are listening that that is that is working. I think the website's an inter- an interesting one. Again, I've been guilty of saying, "Hey, the website's dead," um, and then we come full full circle to say that it, that it's not. But uh, what's what is interesting? I think again back to the comments around email marketing. The website's got to be user friendly, good UX, easy to navigate, good useful content to be able to find. Obviously, work across uh, across devices. However, it would seem that LinkedIn is investing heavily now in company pages to yeah. start to feel more like a website. So product reviews, you can book demos directly. Client, you know, you naturally showcase stuff so it's almost is that going to become the kind of the 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 in-between point between employee drives them to here they can either go directly from there or they then go onto the website or from the website maybe to the linkedin company page to the employee i I don't know yeah that was it see that's a tricky one isn't it i think there are initial stages of a research cycle a journey if you like where you're going to try and as the researcher as the consumer in the b2b or b2c context you're going to try and minimize the effort for the maximum amount of what can i knock out i mean choice is great but you very easily get that a paralysis of too many options and i think where you're on a platform like linkedin and you're looking for the funny thing about LinkedIn is it's mostly about humans at the moment. It's yeah. it's not like I typically go there and look for a business. If I were doing that, then you know Google's the place that I start. Mm-hmm. But having said that, as soon as I know, just this morning I was looking for um, partners for um, one of the bits that we're launching in our business. I did a little bit of web research, but then I immediately went on to LinkedIn to see if I knew anybody at those companies. This yeah. is very weird because I wouldn't do that if I'm going to go buy a phone. It's not like I go onto LinkedIn and go, oh, I wonder if I know somebody down the Apple store. I'm going to have yeah. a chat with him on LinkedIn. It's not it's just not going to happen. Whereas as soon as I get into this business yeah. world, it's like, oh, do I know anybody here? Oh, there's Debbie. I'm going to have a chat with Debbie about you know this because what I really want to do is cut straight to the, can you do X, Y, and Z for my business? Yeah. So sure enough, I found somebody immediately that I was roughly connected to, had a chat with them, and that was it. It was done. Yeah. Where, sorry, that was, I told you, I warned you I'd take you down random rabbit holes that are right, nothing fine. relevant to your question. Um, so I think, you know, looking at something like LinkedIn, what LinkedIn does as a platform and how you use it as a marketer are going to be not necessarily always aligned. I think the yeah. the things that LinkedIn is offering are going to be great, but they are choices for you as a business. And I think you've got to try stuff out. This, this endless constant having to try new things. Oh, Clubhouse has come along. Let's see if we can do. And, you know, you, oh, you God, do a few Clubhouse. weeks on it and then you're like, is it working? Yes or no. Yeah. Everybody thinks that they've got to be on all of these things all the time. And I think that's the greatest danger is that we constantly spend way too much time trying out new stuff. And as a result, we don't dedicate enough to the bread and butter stuff. Yeah. And therefore, yeah, we double down success. And simple things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I th- that's that's the bit that worries me is that mm-hmm. the questions that I get asked are always about the new stuff. It's not how do I make the best use of email? which is still a big chunk of our marketing. That's the bit that we really want to be looking at is have I got the essentials down and only then can I start playing with shiny new toys. Yeah, which is kind of interesting because again, reflecting back to um, my, who I fanboy over Seth at at Forrester's, what he refers to as dynamic guided selling is kind of the future of where kind of this is all all going and sales and marketing have to start properly talking to each other and it's around data so the problem is it's really boring and really hard to start to look at your data stack and bring the data together to start to get something meaningful because it's not sexy it's not shiny it's not the new the new latest thing but actually if you go back to basics 
and start to work out what's working and then build on that you're probably going to do a lot better than to your point simon trying the latest new fad which then it looks like clubhouse is already on the demise anyway based on uh, based on downloads now <laughs> i know i said i know i said that i was gonna let you choose but i'm not because you said <laughs> Uh, which piqued my um, uh, my ears around. You said you got the debate of paid versus organic, and I'll yeah. freely admit I've been out there a couple of years ago going paid is bollocks and doesn't work, and you shouldn't use it. Where I've actually, I look in the last twelve months, I've reacted to paid um, primarily more in a B two C environment on in, on Instagram and so on and so forth, and it's worked very very well. But in the broader construct of paid versus organic question one what do you what and anything your data can tell us there either pros cons or should we be doing yep. both question two cookies i saw a piece of research uh, not the not the nice the nice cookies that you can eat <laughs> in the waistline but cookies in terms of stalking you on the internet i saw a piece of research yesterday that's saying the light it was on the ios app so apple download only four percent of the users who had downloaded the latest version of their Apple um, operating system had opted in to be yeah. tracked, which I'm now starting to see the narrative that everyone's like in, gone into panic mode. So again, with our kind of calm, sensible hats, but with an opinion assignment, because I only have one, uh, organic <laughs> versus paid cookies, go. Yeah, so how long have we got? <laughs> um, th those are two... Massively important ones. Let's start with the organic. So organic reach on average on a platform like Facebook, 5% of your followers. So those are people who have asked to see your content. You can reach an average of 5%, but that includes big celebrities and influencers and whatever else. When you're looking at big brands with more than 100,000 followers, you're lucky if you're getting 1% organic reach. Okay. It's just the painful reality of it. Yeah. Um, that kind of means that you're going to need paid if you want reach of any decent meaning. All so the there's a very important, well, yeah. Facebook, Instagram, you name right. it. I mean, yeah. Pretty much every, the, the one exception based on the data is TikTok, but okay. I find those stats a little bit hard to get my head around. I'm not saying yeah. in any way that they're wrong, but yeah. I have a funny feeling it's mainly because a lot of the users on TikTok are not necessarily because it's less follower based yeah you're seeing a lot more perhaps advertising content in there than you realize and therefore a lot of the brand there's just fewer brands on there yeah, you know the number of brands that are on yeah. and the data will be slightly older and you know all sorts of stuff so caveats in there um but for every other platform organic is just not there because it can't be there's just we're following too many people you can't yeah. see all that stuff it's not it's not just the platforms making money it's our own fault as audiences adding too many things in if you want sizable reach and you want to do it quickly Mm -hmm. then you're going to have to pay for it. Um, this is sort of great aphorism in the advertising world that advertising is a tax on the impatient and the unremarkable. And I absolutely subscribe to that. If you're remarkable, people will share your stuff for you. Yeah. If you are impatient and you need stuff to happen now, you're not going to get that organically. You're going to have to boost it with paid media. You take something like our reports where we get 10, 12 million people a year reading them. People go, wow, that's amazing. You do that organically. You don't put advertising behind it. It's like, yeah, but it's taken 10, 12 years to get there. If I wanted to achieve that today, that ain't going to happen. Yeah. You know, I'm going to have to put media behind it. So organic is a worthy thing to aspire to, but it's going to take a long time to get there unless you win the lottery in marketing. And that is not a good strategy. It's yep. totally possible, but it's just not something you want to bank on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think organic has its place. The really important bit here is that, you know, I'm sure you get these questions as well. And a lot of people listening and viewing today will have asked this question. Should I be on the next platform? Should I be on TikTok? Should I be on Clubhouse? Yep. The answer to that question is yes, you should be on all of them if you think that there's an opportunity. But that doesn't mean you need to be on them organically. Yep. And this is the key bit. By being on it, I don't mean you need to be on. Let's just take TikTok as an example. You don't need to be on there every day publishing and uploading content. If you yep. want to be on TikTok, get yourself an ad budget, yep. get yourself some content and yep. try it out and see if it works. And if you get good results, do it again. And if you can replicate them again and again, keep going until it stops. And if it doesn't work, take it off your list and stop yep. worrying about it because it doesn't work. It doesn't matter whether it's sexy. If it doesn't work for you, it's not the right thing. So uh, this is the bit that I think people are wasting a huge amount of emotion on is they think they need to be on all of these things try it try it once or twice with a bit of paid media yeah. before you think about even investing in building your profile and whatever else reserve your name absolutely do that yeah. and then beyond that 
it's a couple of hundred dollars of trying it out. And if you can't afford that, then... What about LinkedIn? Do you, do you incorporate LinkedIn? In, yeah, so that's, that that's the... It is, and that's the one exception, I think, to the organic piece is if you're not getting your teams to do stuff organically, you're missing a trick. Right. So the big thing about LinkedIn, more than any other platform, is about relationships. Yeah. And I think, you know, you and I, we talk organically. It's not like I have to pay to reach Alex because, you know, Alex is there talking about stuff and we share the same yeah. sorts of stories. And, you know, there's we've all got our individual networks to a greater or lesser extent where that is the case. As a business, if you mm -hmm. want to get your business in front of people, you're still going to need to use paid media on LinkedIn. But as an individual, obviously, you can do that if you want to, but organic is the way to go yeah. because otherwise you're going to spend a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, get your sales teams, get your marketing teams, get everybody that is comfortable using LinkedIn on a regular basis to do so. Encourage people to spend time on there just building relationships. Yeah. It's amazing what will convert. It doesn't have to always be a sales pitch. Mm -hmm. Talking about the weather, weirdly, which as much as it'll annoy me because I'm just very sort of focused on what I want on LinkedIn but you know those conversations matter talk when you when you meet people at a networking event you do the small talk and that absolutely has a place so yeah um I'm in danger of talking endlessly about that you know, it's, fine. Organic... It's, it, it, it's important because um we, we I, I get asked that question all, all the time and I, I now kind of subscribe more to your view around based on the data that I'm seeing that organic on LinkedIn is probably a better approach to, to take, especially if you haven't got a big advertising budget because you can activate the voice of the employee. Fundamentally, it still comes down to the content in of itself needs to be interesting. Yeah engaging the conversation needs to be engaging i do have a subscriber if you're on any other social media platform you want to get any reach paid is the only way to necessarily um necessarily do it and experiment and fish where the fish are if your fish aren't on tiktok don't go fishing on tiktok it's quite that it's quite absolutely simple really the, the, the bit in that as well is just the overlap in the audiences of these platforms is just mind-boggling so there's a stat in there's a whole chart dedicated to this in the report but almost all platforms inc so just youtube which is the biggest in my mind if you look at the audiences i know facebook has the biggest logged in user base but youtube is also available to non-logged in users so i suspect it is having an even larger audience if you include those non-logged in even based on that you're looking at 98 percent of their audience uses at least one other social platform so only two percent is unique facebook it's just over one percent and when you get into things like tiktok it's 0.1 percent so one in a thousand people is unique stop worrying about it you're going to get reach elsewhere yeah. If you need to reach those people, you can do it in multiple different places. And if you're already on one of the bigger ones, the chances are you've reached them already. So you're yeah. looking at frequency, not unique reach. Now, that isn't to say that frequency is a bad thing, but knowing in advance that that is what's happening mm -hmm. will stop you making the mistake of thinking you're suddenly going to reach new audiences on these platforms. Yeah. Um, sorry, there was a loud car going past outside. You also asked about cookies. cookies. So let's, because oh, I'm going to need to wrap up in about 10 minutes, That's unfortunately. Right. That's fine. So That's fine. I've got a day's worth of stuff to talk to you about, Alex. It's not. I'll find a time. I keep going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're right. Cookies. You haven't sworn yet either. I'm most disappointed. I haven't done really well. Um, <laughs> I'll keep going. Um, so the, the cookies bit, I, I don't quite know where to start with this one because I, I, I have this horrible feeling like I'm missing something just mm -hmm. based on the conversations I see in the media and the absolute fear that a lot of my clients are talking about these changes with. And I kind of go, if you were totally dependent on a technology that stalked people mm -hmm. across the internet, then the relationship that you have with your audiences is, is somewhat broken. If, if you cannot see a way to move into a world where you can find contextual relevance and where you can create content that people are willing to come and find, then you want to rethink your marketing. Like I said, that, that whole thing about advertising being attacks on the the lazy and the impatient and the unremarkable that's even more the case when you come to this conversation if you're not creating marketing content that people would actively seek out yeah. then paying to put it in front of them is a weird thing to do if you think about it i'm going to i'm going to pay to give people content they don't want to see in the first place wouldn't you be better off just creating things that people do want to see because ultimately the the expense that goes into it is going to be roughly the same. So mm -hmm. go the extra mile and find something that people actually want. I mean, it's not difficult. God. Um, <laughs> so you get me on my high horse. Does that not create a bit of a tension then between what we've just talked about in terms of to get reach on all the other platforms you need, you need to pay? 
Yeah, but there's so there's this important thing here: paying to get your stuff in front of people versus having to pay to get stocky data that follows people across the internet. Yeah. Absolutely, you know, if you are on, let's just take Facebook as an easy example. Yeah. You can put your content on Facebook and you can use Facebook's targeting tools to do exactly the same as you could do before. So the changing cookie stuff is not going to change your opportunities on Facebook any yeah. way whatsoever, unless you're using Facebook's ad network. But in any case, they've deprecated that across the web. It's only in mobile apps that that is available. And even that, to be honest, it's not going to be a big chunk of most marketers' budgets. Yeah. So you can still do the same thing on Facebook as you could before. You can pretty much do most of the same things on Google ads as you could before. Programmatic, yeah. you're going to face some challenges, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, I think, I, mean, I don't know, again, I, I worry that I'm missing something fundamental here, but if you really need to target it down that finitely, I think you're probably spending way too much time yeah. nerding out on technology rather than thinking about your audience and what they want. Because yeah. if you think about the person rather than the digits that make them up as a demographic, and you think about the psychology of where they're going on the internet and how you can work with that kind of content, you're probably going to be in a better place. I'm very happy for anybody listening to this to go, if they're listening and going, this is complete nonsense, you've completely missed the point, please get in touch with me and challenge me on this and let's dig into it because I need to know where I'm making yeah. a mistake on this one. But if I think about the way I'm marketing my business and in multiple businesses that I market, I don't believe that I need to go to that level of granularity. If I'm creating things that are worthy of people's attention, I can put them out there and I can have a little bit of wastage and that's fine. I think you raise a really valid point there. It's creating content that's worthy of people's attention. And we've got, we have got to lazy as humans and we want the quick fix, which kind of almost ties back to shareholders, immediate returns, the latest things, KPIs driving all the wrong sorts of behavior. My brother works in this space for a large organization who trades billions of dollars in our data and they're not overly concerned about it. They, they having to work some stuff, a pro pro programmatic being potentially challenging for them, especially in the TV space as we cut the cord. Um, but overall they're like, yeah, it's, it, it is what it is. We just have to work around it and there'll be a different way, <laughs> a different way to, to do things. So um, yeah, it, things, things change and evolve. We have to, you know, have to move with it. But I, I think in everything it boils down to, I really like that turn of phrase. It's gotta be worthy of your audience. And if it is, they'll engage. And if it isn't, they won't. <laughs> You've got to start rethinking re about a different strategy or different approach by, hey, talking to your customers would be a good right. thing. What do you find worthy? What do you want to hear from us? <laughs> I think, you know, let's just go back to the stat that you started with, 12 trillion hours. Yeah. will spend on the internet. So this nonsense that people have short attention spans in the YouTube, that's utter fucking nonsense. There we <laughs> go, I swore, I had to do it for you. Um, people have exactly the same level of attention. They just have way lower tolerance for crap because they have so many better options available at the flick of a thumb. You think about Netflix and what that did to broadcast TV and how suddenly there is a death of formats like reality TV. Sure enough, you've got a little bit of reality TV going on, although it's moved more into social channels where it's better suited. Yep. But reality TV was created as an easy way to churn out content that had advertising around it. But when you go into a Netflix world where what you want to do is sit down and binge watch a series over 10 hours, 12 hours sometimes, that is the ultimate proof that there is no such thing as a shortage of attention. You know, you think about the next big blockbuster that comes out, I will quite happily cancel my appointments with my friends, yeah. order food especially, sit down in front of that screen and turn off all interruptions. So as a marketer, that's what you're competing with. You're not competing with the other person in your category. You're not competing with inflation or what. You're competing with all of the other stuff that's going on in people's lives because it's all here. Yeah. My life is this device now. When I'm seeing my friends and I'm chatting to them, it's on here. When I'm watching content, it's on there, maybe cast to a bigger screen. But, you know, worthy of people's attention is not just about your advertising. It's your entire marketing world. Because if you're not remarkable, if you're not adding value to people's lives, then it's going to be really difficult to justify being a part of their existence. So even when it comes to TV advertising, you know, you look at now we're in a world where I can't remember the exact stat. We're close to half of total TV time is now 
through internet streaming platforms, mm -hmm. which means that a lot of the TV advertising has disappeared. That's not yeah. to say it's not relevant still. But if you are a marketer and you're looking at that, your first thought is, how can I get involved in the TV content and add value? Yes, product placement's a great opportunity there, but I've seen some fascinating examples recently of companies that are making content for Netflix, mm -hmm. which is basically just an advertorial as a TV show. And I'm watching them because they're good. Yeah. So, sorry, I'm yeah, down a rabbit hole again. I think, that, I think you just raised, you know, it's, it's really interesting, <clears throat> interesting point around, you know, people, you're vying for people's attention. And if you get their yeah. attention and it's worthy of it, then then uh, happy days. Simon, this has been awesome. Um, <laughs> I'm conscious of your time because if I let you go, you're going to go again and then suddenly <laughs> to, cut me, yeah, to, get, to cut me off. Well, I've got to prepare for a presentation. I'm giving this up this afternoon to a live uh, live audience on, on Tinternet, which I need to start thinking about. No uh, problem. Where can, where can people, which I'll be citing some of your data, you'll be pleased to. Uh, you'll be, to uh, Thanks, sir. Uh, where can, I know you've already talked about this, but where can I point people to if they want to learn more about you, your business, and how you can help them? So the best place to start is with the data. So datareportal.com. I should have thought about that name when I thought about creating it. It's not the easiest one to say. datareportal.com. Uh, you'll find all of our reports across 10 years, 240 countries, all for free, which is amazing. Um, if you want to then nerd out with me and have conversations, LinkedIn is, surprisingly enough, having mentioned it a few times today, the best place to find me. So Simon Kemp, I've got a black and white profile picture. Uh, you'll find me nice and easy. I will put the links to wherever I don't, can't do this thing on the YouTube when you point me <laughs> somewhere. I'm not down with the kids on that. I'll put the links in both the podcast and the and the vlog for people to go find that. If you haven't seen Simon's reports, I urge you to do it. It's some fascinating research, really helpful, as Simon um, uh, said. And also, if you've listened to this podcast and you want to debate cookies with Simon in terms of the digital, or maybe the real ones, I don't know, um, please do. But Simon, thank you so much for your time on this. I really, really do appreciate it. And for my listeners, um, if you want to be on this podcast, you know what to do. If you want to recommend people to be on this podcast, uh, hit me up on the varying channels that, that I'm on, including TikTok. Otherwise, uh, wherever you are in the world, uh, thank you for listening. And I'll see you all next week. Simon, thank you. Thanks, Alex.